In this video, we will be going over questions 1 through 4 from the free response question, the free response section of the 2014 AP Biology exam. Question 1. This description is kind of long, so I'm going to set aside a little bit of time to read through it. All right. Question A. On the axes provided, create an appropriately labeled graph to illustrate the sample means of three populations to within 95% confidence. So first, let's uh, let's gather the information we know uh, to construct these uh, to graphically represent these confidence intervals. So we want the sample mean, uh, the point estimator for each of these populations, and we want the standard error and Fortunately, both of these are in the table right down here, so we don't have to do any calculations. So for population one, the sample mean is nine trichomes per centimeter squared. For population two, it's 11, and for population three, it is 14. And the standard error is the same for all three of the populations, its value is one. So we're going to, we're just going to make a graph. Uh, we're going to uh, graph the tri mean trichomes per square meter of each of these three populations, and it should look something like this. Though it doesn't have to look exactly like this, but what uh, you need to remember to include is to have the scale on the axis, the y-axis, and have the x-axis and the y-axis labeled correctly, and have each of the bars labeled correctly. So here is the bar that represents the standard error of the mean. And it said that the standard error is uh, 1. And we want to, uh, to make an interval of two standard errors above and or below the mean. So here our bar goes from 7 to 11 because the mean of the sample was 9. So that bar from 7 to 11 represents a 95% confidence interval for the true mean trichomes per square centimeters of all the plants in that population. And we do the same for population 2 and then for population 3. Based on the sample means and standard errors of the means, identify the two populations that are the most likely to have statistically significant differences in the mean stem trichome densities. Justify your response. So here is the graph we made once again, and you can see that the you can see that the standard error bars, the confidence interval bars for population and pop, population one and population three do not line up at all. Uh, the top the top bound for the high bound for population one is eleven. The low bound for population Three is thir is twelve, so there is a very small chance that they uh, will have a, a difference in mean stem trichome densities that is not statistically significant. So uh, we are going to say that population one and population three are going to be the most likely to have statistically significant differences in the mean stem trichome densities. Describe the dependent and independent variables and the control treatment for an experiment to test the hypothesis that higher trichome density in plants is selected for in the presence of herbivores. Identify an appropriate duration of the experiment to ensure that natural selection is measured, and predict the experimental results that would support the hypothesis. Okay, so stated again, our hypothesis is that the plants will evolve to produce a higher density of trichomes on their stems when in the presence of herbivores. So our independent variable for the experiment. So what we are trying to see uh, will induce the change is the presence of herbivores or the lack thereof. So that is going to be our independent variable. Our dependent variable, we want to see if the density of the trichomes changes based on the environment that the plants are in. So that's going to be our dependent variable. Our control group is going to be a, a population of plants that does not experience predation by herbivores. B. 
because and it's going to have all the other conditions are going to be normal the population the pollination is going to be normal and the weather will be normal and those factors are also going to be kept the same for our experimental group the duration has to be several generations because natural selection takes time and even even if it's only one generation long you might not see an, a very significant change so if we so we want to have an experiment that lasts several generations so that the plants that are producing the most trichomes are going to be the ones that are selected for because their environment contains a lot of predators. So the result that would support the hypothesis is, uh, so we do the experiment for several generations. We measure the trichome density in each of the two groups. And what we want to find is that the plants that were in the environment with the herbivores are going to have a higher density of trichomes than the counterparts in the control group because they were subject to that selective pressure of predation that led them to produce more trichomes over several generations. Question 2. Mammalian milk contains antibodies that are produced by the mother's immune system and passed to offspring during feeding. Mammalian milk also contains a sugar, lactose, and may contain proteins, protein A, protein B, and casein, as indicated in the table. Using the data in the table, construct a cladogram on the template provided to indicate the most likely evolutionary relationships among the different mammals. Indicate on the cladogram where each of the characters most likely arose in the evolutionary process and justify the placement of the characters on the cladogram. So here is our chart of the characters again. And what do we notice at first? Uh, we see that the cow, the horse, and the pig all have all four of the, have lactose and all three of the proteins. They have all the characters. But the human and the cat only have lactose and protein A. And essentially how we're going to construct the cladogram is we have to notice that, we have to remember that when species uh, have, have similar uh, proteins or similar proteins within a substance that they produce, such as milk, uh, that means they're more likely to be closely related. So that means that the cat and the human are probably cl more closely related to each other than they are to the cow, the horse, and the pig. And the cow, the horse, and the pig are more closely related to each other than they are to the cat or the human. So we can say that the cat and the human are on an opposite branch of the phylogenetic tree than the cow, the horse, and the pig. So we're going to make a tree that has two branches. And on one branch, we're going to have the cow, the sh Okay, sorry, that's the sheep. It should be a horse. The cow, the horse, and the pig. And on the bottom branch, we're going to have the cat and the human. And this might not, this might not be the actual evolutionary relationship between these species, but, but this is just a, this is just an AP question. So, uh, so don't worry about issues like that. Just uh, go with the information the question gives and just use that. Describe four steps in the activation of the mother's specific immune response following exposure to a bacterial pathogen. Predict how the mother's immune response would differ upon a second exposure to the same bacterial pathogen a year later. So I went over the basics of the primary immune response in a different video, but I'm going to go over it again. So essentially what happens is uh, the cells that make up the innate immune system, like uh, macrophages and dendritic cells, are going to engulf pathogens. They are going to digest them or break them down, and which will leave the an their antigens behind. And they will present those antigens on their surface. And there are also going to be uh, naive B cells of the adaptive immune system that are engulfing and destroying bacteria. And these cells will all present antigens to T cells and the T cells are going to activate a signaling response that basically uh, carries out the rest of the primary immune response of the human body and this will signal other T cells as well as these the, those naive B cells. 
So the naive B cells are going to produce antibodies specific to that specific specific to that one antigen, the antigen from that uh, pathogen. So, and they are also going to produce memory B cells and plasma cells, and those cells are also going to produce antibodies specific to that pathogen that will latch on to that pathogen because they will bind to those antigens, and that will signal uh, T cells to destroy them. During the second exposure, the response is going to be a lot faster because, remember, during the first exposure, we produced a lot of memory B cells and plasma cells. And these cells are specifically tailored to produce antibodies for that one pathogen. So when this pathogen shows up again, the response is going to be a lot quicker because the antibodies are going to be released almost immediately and the uh, infection will be taken care of pretty quickly. Predict the most likely consequence for a nursing infant who is exposed to an intestinal bacterial pathogen to which the mother was exposed three months earlier. Justify your prediction. So during pregnancy, antibodies do pass from the mother to the child uh, through the umbilical cord. And this uh, provides immunity in the first few months of a baby's life, which is when they are most vulnerable. If the child is still being best breastfed, uh, you're going to have additional antibodies that are passed through the breast milk, as it said in the question. And if the mother had received a salmonella or whatever pathogen infection before, then she would have uh, antibodies for that pathogen. And so the child is also going to have these antibodies. However, if the child is not being best breastfed, then they might, they might not have uh, sufficient numbers of those antibodies anymore, or they might not, or even if they are being breastfed, they might not be receiving sufficient numbers of the antibodies, and so they have a high chance of becoming sick and dying. So uh, these are just some possible scenarios, but uh, on the AP exam, you are expected to choose one of them, and uh, you can choose either one, uh, there is no, uh, you don't know how long the infant has been nursing and how old they are or anything like that. So, and you can't really predict this for sure. So as long as you choose uh, one of these explanations and back it up with sufficient explanation, then uh, you should be fine. You don't have to uh, put both of them down. Question three. As part of a new suburban development, a sports complex consisting of athletic fields and buildings is constructed in a formerly wooded area. Part A. Predict one ecological consequence on the local plant community that is likely to result during the site preparation and construction of the sports complex. Justify your prediction. Part B. To maintain the playing fields, large quantities of water and chemicals are applied regularly to the grass-covered areas. Predict one effect on the local animal community that might result from regular use and maintenance of the playing fields. Justify your prediction. So the most obvious consequence of, consequence of part A is that when these developers will be, will be uh, constructing the sports complex, they are going to be cutting down a lot of trees and burning a lot of shrubs and clearing the area. And this is going to result in a loss of biomass from this woodland community that was formerly in the area. And in part B, uh, if you're putting a lot of chemicals on the grass and a lot of water as well, the soil might be uh, saturated already and these chemicals might run off or they just might uh, contaminate the soil where they already are. So this is going to be pretty bad for the animal community because there's going to be a lot of chemicals building up in uh, animals that eat the grass. And as, and as these animals get eaten, the pollution is going to accumulate and work its way up through the food chain. And so a lot of these animals might face harm or even death. Question four. This description is kind of long, so once again, I'm going to set aside some time to read through it.
Okay, so now let's take a look at our graph. So you can see at that at time zero months, the genetic diversity is very large. You can see that the range, the 95% uh, confidence interval for the, the mean number of spots for the entire population is very large. It goes from like 8 to 12. It's uh, there is a very r wide range of spots that can happen and a wide range of genetic diversity among these adult male guppies. Then what happens when you get to time six months, that bar becomes much, much smaller. And that means that there is a lot less variation of spots. As you can see, it's around hovering around 12. And that means that the genetic diversity of this population uh, has gone down by quite a bit. And you can see that even in uh, the following months, uh, the bars, the confidence intervals remain very small, much smaller than they were at time zero months. So part A says describe the change in, in genetic variation between zero and six, six months. So the genetic variation decreases a lot because, as I said, the error bars are much smaller than they were before, and so the number of spots varies less. Part B says, propose one type of mating behavior that could have resulted in the observed change in the number of spots per adult male guppy between 6 and 20 months in the absence of the predator. So, in the absence of the predator, the number of spots, as you can see, it went up by quite a bit from 12 to like 13 so we can infer that the guppies that had more spots were more likely to mate and reproduce hence the increase in the average number of spots uh, this could have also taken place randomly it's not that unlikely And finally, uh, C, propose an evolutionary mechanism that explains the change in average number of spots between 6 and 20 months in the presence of the predator. So in the presence of the predator, the average number of spots went down from 12 to around 9. So we can say that there was a directional selection in the face of the selective pressure uh, of these predators that favored individuals that had fewer spots. And this would make them a lot more likely to mate and reproduce and be successful. And so over the coming months, uh, the individuals with fewer spots uh, were more likely to survive, which brought the average number of spots down by quite a bit. Thank you for watching this video, and please subscribe for more AP Biology content.